Um, he's going to be doing a presentation on um, disease management in the home garden. Um, very important topic. Um, but before we start, I just wanted to mention a couple of housekeeping items. One, um, harvest totals are due on Wednesday. So even if you don't have harvest totals, please email Rachel um, and let her know because we just want to make sure we have that active communication going. Um, and make sure you're still engaged in the program. We do have harvest totals, email them to Rachel. Um, and that would be a big, big help. Um, we do have our dehydration workshop tomorrow. So I think there's a couple of tickets left in that if anybody's interested um, in attending. Um, I sent out an email on that last week. So feel free to check that out. Um, what else? I feel like there's more, but um, Adam has some handouts um, in the back for folks in person if you want to grab those. Um, and then folks online, he'll have a QR code at the end of his presentation that you can find some of those resources at. So um, yeah, without further ado, I'll hand it over to Adam. Um, and thank you. Okay. So online, let us know if you can't hear me well. Make sure that you can. Uh, but I'm with you the Washington County Extension Office. How many people have ever utilized the Extension Office? Okay, so a good number of you. If you're not, basically what we do is we bridge the gap between the university and the public. And the public. So we bring research-based information to you. What I specifically do is functionally, I'm a horticulture agent. And so our county is lucky in that we actually have three ag agents. Very few counties in our region have that. And because of that, we're able to specialize somewhat. So I handle horticulture. Anthony handles livestock and forages. Elena handles more the business side of things. And also a lot of our youth programs, like animal showing, um, some of the competitions and various things. So we have a little bit of speciality within our office, which is really good. Let me see if I can get the clicker to work. So I don't keep on the back and forth. There we go. I'll just mention if I do mention trade names tonight or brand names, it's not an endorsement by myself or the university. Just a way to have clarity and for us to have a conversation. It doesn't mean that similar products aren't just as good. It's just I may be trying to use the one that's more familiar. So don't take that as any negative against something I don't happen to mention that would be equally as good for use. The other thing is nothing I say in this presentation trumps the pesticide label. Any pesticide product that you use, whether conventional or organic, the label is the law. You have to follow what it says. So nothing I say, if it's in any way contravening that label, you go by the label, uh, what I say. So real quickly, you are involved in gardening and even more specifically organic gardening. And so I like to look at organic gardening and I come from organic from a commercial production background. So four and a half years, I actually ran the organic certification program for the state of Kentucky. We had about 200 clients. So been on all kinds of organic farms, uh, did trainings in other states even, I see some unique things that way. But basically I look at it as a farm thing and then we bring it to the home setting. But really organic gardening, organic production commercially, it's a systems-based approach. What I mean by that, it's not just a substitution. So it's not where if I would have used Miracle Grow, now I'll use this instead, or if I would have used Seven Dust, now I'll use this instead. It's not really that. It's about creating a system that works. So it's looking at creating healthy plants through healthy soils because healthy plants have better yields, they resist pests better. Uh, it's about looking at the environment. And so, you know, can we have beneficial insects out there that are eating the detrimental insects? And can we get a balance there? So it is really about a balanced approach. It's not about the absence of insects. Sometimes people come to organic gardening and think it's free of inputs or free of pesticide products. It's not. If you are gardening organically or if you're a commercial producer, you will be utilizing some pesticides. They just happen to be different than what conventional growers sometimes more expensive, lots of times not as effective. Um, but we do have the judicious use of 
inputs, whether it's fertilizers, whether it's pesticides. Without those, we're not going to have success with organic gardening. Also, since we are here tonight talking about diseases or pests, uh, we need to talk about integrated pest management for a moment. And if we're going to simplify IPM or integrated pest management down, simplest way I can put it is you don't first reach for a chemical control. Basically, you use other strategies, other practices to reduce your reliance on that chemical control. And that's better for the environment. Typically, it's better for you as a producer from a financial standpoint. Um, and you can see these are some of the strategies, and we'll talk about them, but things like crop rotation. Probably have heard about that. That's something we really want to do, whether it's in our garden or commercially. Resistant varieties where possible. There's plenty of things that we do not have resistance to. But where we do have it, let's take advantage of that tool, making sure that we are providing a healthy environment, so adequate fertility in the water. Uh, I've worked with some commercial producers in the job before this. And basically, one thing I found is they simply, they were organic producers, they simply were not fertilizing enough, wasn't close. So I sat down with them, worked out a budget, figured out, okay, what can you spend on fertilizer? And we got it to work and they did that. And what they found by upping their fertility, they're actually able to pick for an additional two weeks on a plant. And so they always thought, well, it's just succumbing to disease, it's succumbing to insect pressures. Reality was the plants were outgrowing their fertility. So when we have adequate fertility and water where necessary and when necessary, we have healthier plants, we have better production. And certainly we have some strategies for control that are not simply a chemical option. And we'll talk about some of those this evening. One thing to note about organic pest controls in general, they're non-synthetic or natural in the language of the organic rules. And so what that means we'll find often they are plant oils, or a mineral of some type, a biological agent, or organism, or maybe a derivative from a biological. And so all of these work in different ways, and we'll talk about some of these as we go through tonight. Still have to follow label directions. Simply because it's organic doesn't mean there can't be a, a level of harm associated with it, whether to ourselves or to something else. For instance, uh, this is just one example of acute toxicity and sublethal effects of botanical insecticides to honeybees. So we can even have negative impacts on our beneficial insects, on pollinators with organic products. So don't think because it's organic, we don't have to pay attention to those sorts of things. One big question you may be wondering and asking is, will I need to spray? Do I have to use some chemical control agents? Maybe. Part of it depends on what you're trying to get out of the garden. So there are some crops that we are much more likely to need to use some control on than others. Some of it's about timing, some of it's about disease versus insects. Part of it is what will you tolerate? What's your threshold? If you're just eating out of your own garden, eh, who cares if something's a little ugly? You can eat around the ugly parts. But if it's something you're wanting to share or to sell, suddenly now your threshold might suddenly be a lot more limited. So damage becomes a problem. The other thing is how important is your harvest? Obviously you're putting time and effort into these gardens, but probably for most of us, if we have something that fails in the garden, we can go to the farmer's market, we can go to the grocery store. It's not a all or nothing scenario. We have other avenues to get that product. But depending on where we're at on all that, that's how we kind of make the decision. Do we want to use uh, controlled products? Because quite honestly, there's a cost associated with them too. It's not wise to spend $4 on controlling uh, for your pest or insect if you can go to the grocery store and buy it for a dollar. We may not come out ahead that way. The other thing to keep in mind and why we have to sort of go into this and trying to figure out where we want to be with it is the very same environment that's good for our vegetable garden that allows us to grow is the very same environment that's ideal for pests. We can't separate them. You create an environment where no pests will be you're not going to have happy vegetables. And so they always go together. We have to try to coexist with that. When it comes to gardening, I don't care if we're doing conventional or organic. The number one thing is we want to look at prevention rather than cure. Because particularly with organic products, 
there are very few curative products. You need things in place before the problem uh, either shows up or gets big. So it's much easier to kill insects when they're small. It's much easier to prevent disease infections than it is to cure it. So really, we don't have curative products. Even on the conventional side, curative is not easily achieved. And so we do want to do things like cultural practices that give us an advantage, as well as utilizing pesticides correctly. There are some diseases that if you react to it after it's already there, after it's already causing damage, you're kind of wasting your efforts and money because it's not going to be real successful. It's not a good strategy. So keep in mind, prevention is what we focus on. Talking about some of those integrated pest management cultural practices, these are things like disease resistant plants. Again, this might mean we have to be ordering online rather than buying seeds at Walmart, because we might be looking more towards things that have a commercial design behind them rather than a homeowner design. There are heirlooms that do have resistance to them. We probably find more resistance in hybrid because they have been specifically bred and created largely for their uh, pest resistance. We wanna look at our soils, are our soils containing adequate fertility? Do we have a soil test in place? Are we you know, adding fertilizer as we're cropping things? Oftentimes in the home garden, we're putting multiple crops in there in a season. When it gets done, we pull it out, we plant again. That's awesome, that's efficient. But we also have to realize if we're pulling more out of that garden more frequently, we have to be putting nutrition back in there so that we don't basically mine the soils. Uh, the other thing, do we have water available to us? Number one thing I always like to ask people if they want to do a garden is, do you have a water hose nearby? Because almost every season, there's going to be a time where it's beneficial for you to have irrigation available to you. Doesn't mean you can't garden if you don't have it but it will probably, some years more than others, reduce your yield ability. We want an area that has good airflow because one of the things that when it comes to disease, and we'll see it when we get into some specifics, the wetter plants are, particularly their foliage, more likely we are to see disease. So we like to use irrigation methods like drip, or even if we're watering by hand, we don't want to water the plant, we want to water the soil. So avoiding leaf wet good airflow so it dries out faster. The same reason why we prune fruit trees in part is to get better airflow, more sunlight penetration. The other thing to consider is cleaning up in the garden, sanitation. This one's important, uh, particularly if we have a large garden and maybe we start over here and then as the season progresses, we may be doing successive plantings of tomatoes or something like that. Because we can plant tomatoes up until about the middle of July and we'll still get a harvest before frost. So if you have an early season crop that you put out like a week from today, maybe, and it's still kind of just dragging over there in the corner, it's done producing, it basically sort of becomes a nursery for diseases and insects. So what's better is whenever your early planting start to peter off, start to lose production, rip them out, get rid of them, because we don't want those to become nurseries for diseases and insects. And certainly at the end of the year, we have some issues too. And then crop rotation, rotating <laughs> between crop families because plants that are in the same family typically have the same diseases and insect pests. So if there's something left behind, whether it's crop debris or the soil, and we put a susceptible plant there, more likely to get infested or attacked by those pests. One thing that's great for crop rotation is corn, sweet corn, because it's a grass. Basically, it's the only grass we grow in our garden. So if you don't grow sweet corn, you may consider it just because it's a great rotation. So a little detail on planting resistant varieties. Here we have tomatoes, because they're a good example. There's a lot of tomatoes that have at least some resistance. So when you see these letters after the name of a tomato, like Roma VF, that's actually referencing some disease. BF should be verticillium and fusarium wilt. Uh, here from a catalog, we see one that is highly resistant to uh, early blight. Fusarium wilt races one and two. It's just kind of like we have different varieties of plants. We can have different varieties of disease. Uh, there's late blight, 
don't remember what SLS is. Uh, and then we have verticillium wheel thinking. So they'll have a diagram or a legend somewhere that will actually specify what all those letters represent. So you don't get in front of people and forget what some of them are. <laughs> but uh, the more that's there, the better. Because some of these, we don't have great tools, either organic or conventional from the home garden. So having native resistance in what we're planting is a huge bonus in our favor to begin with. We don't have resistance for every pest. Resistance is not immunity, so it doesn't mean we can't get it, but it is a step in the right direction to begin with that. When we're talking about healthy soil, I think I've already used that phrase several times, uh, we can look at it in a number of different ways with how we measure that. But in my mind, for our gardens, we're looking for a soil that's productive. It's got sufficient nutrients to actually grow the crops we're wanting to grow. It's structurally sound, it has good pore space because our roots need pore space because that's where they get both oxygen and water. If you have a compacted soil, you don't have pore space and you don't have enough air and water. And we can flood our soils and push out all the air and that's not good either. So we need to pay attention to more water. The other thing is we want a microbiologically active soil. This is a topic of current research and it's becoming more and more realized that Microbially healthy soils are important. It's about denying some pests the opportunity to live in those soils. It's about nutrient cycling. It's about symbiotic relationship with plants. And so we want a microbially diverse soil and one that is active. And we'll talk some about how we can get there. So with healthy soils, about the number one thing we can do, how many of you all would complain that you have clay soil? Anybody? <laughs> Most everybody, because that's where we're at. That's the region where, unless you're down along the Nola Chucky or something like that, where you've got sandy soil, which comes with a host of other problems that, it, that are unrelated to what clay soils have, we've got clay soil. So the number one thing to do to a clay soil is add organic. You're not going to go wrong with that. And what organic matter does is basically it lets uh, the clay soil be better behaved because clay soils actually are a good soil to grow in. If you look at all the big trees we have growing around here. What are they growing in? Clay soils. So they're not deficient in nutrients. But when we start doing things to them, they become problematic. If they're wet, they're wet. If they're dry, they're dry. And organic matter helps alleviate that. You will sometimes see online recommendations for adding gypsum to clay soils. For some clay soils, gypsum does good. For all, it doesn't do any. All it is is adding calcium and sulfur to the soil because gypsum is just calcium sulfate. Not going to harm anything if you use it, but it's not going to fix our heavy clay soils because we don't have the right type. Uh, and so again, you know, organic matter, we're talking about compost, but compost can be limited if we're making it ourselves. It becomes expensive on anything but the smallest scale. So, you know, utilizing things like leaves. If you're raking leaves or blowing leaves, Blow them into the garden. They'll break down on their own. You don't necessarily have to build a compost pile. We can use things like straw. We can use things like hay. We do want to be cautious about things like hay, straw, manure, or bedding, or even lawn clippings, because they can all have persistent herbicides. Those are herbicides that will still be active when we place them in the garden. So even if it went through a cow or a horse, it comes out manure on the back end, still with the herbicide in it, that can cause damage to our plants. Uh, and so I have seen that every season, a couple of times we'll see it. Know that this doesn't go away quickly. And in fact, if you're composting it, it may actually make it last longer because the way compost will hold on to nutrients or chemicals. Um, so always ask if you're getting manures or if you're getting hay. Uh, straw typically isn't a problem um, unless it's been used as bedding and maybe there's some hay mixed into it, but ask them what sort of herbicides they're using in their forage production. Because if, if they can't tell you what they're using in the pasture or the hay field, or if they're purchasing in those from el uh, elsewhere to feed their animals, I would forgo it because it is a risk, or there are some ways where you can do a bioassay, which is to basically plant some plants into it and see how they react. Beans and tomatoes are extremely sensitive, so they're typically the first in the garden to show symptoms, as well as what we use to 
do the bioassay. If anybody wants more information on that, I can provide that to you. But just be aware of those persistent herbicides are out there. If it's your own lawn and you know you're not putting herbicides on it, there's no worries. The other thing to have healthy soils is to reduce the physical disturbance. So this means minimizing tillage. Tillage, I think, is an excellent tool whenever we're beginning, beginning to establish beds, but I don't think it's a tool we should be using every single year. We're using for um, weed control, for instance. It's one of the things that happens when we till for weed control is we're bringing up seeds that are already in the soil. So we're actually not even helping ourselves. We're just bringing up the next crop. Uh, so anytime we can reduce tillage, do it, because what essentially happens, tillage cuts up all that organic matter. And if you remember from high school chemistry, anytime you increase surface area, you increase the rate of the reaction. So we got biological chemical reactions happening in our soils. So basically we burn through that organic matter faster when we chop it up. We also are taking away structure from our soils. And that's bad because that's how we get more water and air into our soils. So anytime we can skip tillage, it's going to be beneficial. We also never want to have bare soil. So soil should always be covered somehow. Whether it's with an organic mulch or something living, we don't want bare ground. Bare ground is more susceptible to erosion. It's also, believe it or not, getting less water into the soil if it's bare. So if we have a, a lawn there, we actually get more water infiltrating into that soil than if it was bare ground. That's sometimes counterintuitive. Well, what organic mulch do that seems to be hard to come by? Well, it can be everything from arborist wood chips. Uh, that's sometimes one that can be a little bit accessible uh, and sometimes for free. If you catch them in your neighborhood when they're doing trimming, lots of times they're looking for a place to dump it. It can be compost. It can be, you know, leaves, it can be straw, it can be hay, it can be animal bedding, it can be manure. Basically, either it used to be living or it came out of something that was living. I guess the organic is the issue. Well, the or, no, see, organic in this instance is organic with a little of it. So that's, that's actually a good clarification to make. So actually, under the organic regulations, there is no such thing as organic compost with the big O, meaning certified, because the laws for organic certification only apply to agricultural products. So compost, manures, potting soils, fertilizers, soil amendments, none of those are agricultural products in the view of the USDA. So yes, you can go to Walmart or somewhere and purchase miracle Grow organic potting soil. And it may very well be compliant with the organic regulations, but it is, is not certified organic. And there's actually products I've seen that there was a uh, soil amendment fertility product that was actually derived from a sewage sludge, which I know it sounds terrible. How many people have ever heard of mill organite? Mill organite. And it's perfectly safe and acceptable to use it in vegetable parts, but mill organite happens to be a sewage sludge derived product, which is not allowed under organic regulations. But this company, and it was not mill organite, this company, they had something other organic fertilizer, organic soil amendment in their name. They were able to do that because, again, that type of product is not regulated by the organic regulations. So just because it says organic on it, doesn't mean it fully complies with the organic regulations if it's not under the purview of those regulations. So it's a little complicated, but the short answer is here when I say organic, I mean organic in chemistry, meaning if it's alive or it came out of something else alive. Basically composed of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Yes? What about cardboard? Cardboard, I think, is in a so I know cardboard is used a lot, uh, including by some organic certified operations. I don't know, what I don't like about cardboard is there is some research that shows that cardboard can slow the diffusion of air into the soil. Cardboard doesn't last forever, it breaks down. So certainly I don't think it's the worst thing in the world. Uh, under the organic regulations, it can't have you know, the glossy colored inks on it, water in the tape, and things like that. Um, but if you're in a pit and you've got to cover your soil. 
you can do that, but typically you've got to cover that again with something else, like a mulch, because cardboard when it dries out, it flies away, especially when we have wind like we had the past couple of days. Uh, that's, that's one of the challenges to it, is it doesn't necessarily negate utilizing something else. It's just an underlayment for that something else. And so, again, I mean, I don't think it's a bad material, and certainly it can comply with organic regulations, uh, but I don't know that it's the best material either. And, and part of that is I don't know that there's a tremendous amount of research out there on it yet. Uh, but certainly there are market gardeners that are using it to good effect. So I would say it would be a possibility or your option strategy as well. And I mentioned earlier, well, so let's talk about living plants as ground covers. So how many people have ever used a winter cover crop? Few people, excellent. So winter cover crops are great because you're not losing space to grow in. You're growing in an off season, but typically, unless we've got something like a high tunnel or we've got areas that we're using low tunnels or covers over, it's just sitting there. So if you don't want to do a living cover crop, which is the best, because one of the things that happens is those plants, while they're sitting there, even in winter, even if they're not growing a tremendous amount, we're growing winter hardy things, winter leaf, Austrian winter pea, you can do rye, but rye grows more in the spring faster than wheat does. So sometimes if you get away from it, if you're trying to do things more manually, I'll say stick with winter wheat, not rye. But when it's sitting there, it's actually the roots, as long as that ground's not frozen, they're still growing and doing their thing. And one of the things they do is they release exudates. So they're actually releasing substances into the soil, and that is helping feed that microbial community. So to me, living cover crops are always the gold standard for covering our soils when we're not actively producing them. And there are summer cover crops we do, warm season things. So we can have a cover crop any time of year. But the one that works most easily for a lot of scenarios is a winter cover crop, because most of the time we're not cropping anything there already. So if you can do that, do it. I think you'll see benefits from it. It grabs any available fertility that is there. It might be lost to runoff or to uh, uh, leaching through the soil profile, You're feeding your or, uh, microbial community. And depending on the scenario, we can till it in the, in the spring. This is one of those ones where, okay, tillage is a tool. Sometimes when we do cover crops, it's good to use it. We don't have to do that, uh, but it is something that we can use and really, because we're incorporating large amounts of biomass, we're offsetting burning up that carbon that we would be doing ordinarily just with tillage alone. So to me, I always tell people, you know, if we have to use tillage to incorporate a cover crop, we're kind of offsetting the negative of the tillage with the positives of the cover crop. If we can find scenarios where we don't till it in, where we use it as a surface mulch, we're probably even better off. Uh, but certainly tillage might be part of the decision process. Rotation of crop families, kind of said it earlier, crop families share pests and insects or diseases. The longer we can rotate, the better. Can't rotate too long. So if you've got plenty of room and you can do four years, that's great. I know some uh, commercial farms that are on a seven year rotation. So they can tell you what's gonna be there next year because they have a seven year rotation they work for. And that helps them reduce the need for inputs such as pest control products. So it is a good idea to rotate, do it as best you can, you know, from one end of the garden this year to that end next year. That's not bad, it's not perfect. We'd love to have our tomatoes over here this year and then have another bed over there, have them over there next year, that's better. But whatever your limitations are, rotate as much as you can and pay attention to crop families uh, and understand who's in what family. So water and the irrigation in the garden, we probably will need it at some point during the season. It's rare that we would get a season when we don't. Since I've been doing this, there's been like one season where irrigation wasn't necessary. That's when I was back still in college. We were doing a summer plot where we were doing irrigation on pumpkins. We ran it once to distribute some nitrogen fertilizer through the drip lines, and then we didn't turn it on the rest of the summer. That's highly unusual. So certainly there are scenarios where we wouldn't need irrigation, but most seasons at some point we're going to need it. Mulching, again, an organic mulching, or even if we're using something like 
of the landscape fabrics or even plastic mulch if we were on a commercial scale. What they do in part is reduce water loss from the soil and they can help keep the soil cooler. So it is a good tool for more than one reason. The availability of water is important to plants and we want it as even as possible. So we don't want things to get super dry and then we go drench everything. Then they get super dry and we keep going back and forth. Because that is the perfect way to get blossom end rot on tomatoes and peppers. Because blossom end rot is a lack of calcium in the fruit. It's not a lack of calcium in our soil. Our soils have thousands of pounds of calcium. You do not have to put rollates or tongues in your tomato hole when you plant because it's not about a lack in the soil. It's about, it's not getting into the fruit. Calcium moves into the plant with the flow of water. We don't have even watering, basically, you know, dribbling into that plant all the time, bringing in the calcium. When we dry out, it shuts down, it doesn't grow. Then we throw water, it grows real fast. There's not able to bring enough calcium into that fruit. And so by having a more even irrigation program, where we, and this sometimes happens a lot when we do have those hot, dry summers and we just rely on precipitation on rain. When we get rain, you end up with a lot of tomatoes cracking, you end up with a lot of blossom in rot. It's because we don't have even soil moisture conditions. So, yes, there are some products we can spray like blossom in rot isn't a disease, a lot of people kind of think it is, it's actually a nutritional deficiency. But the reality is it's a water problem. We get our watering right, we don't have loss of mineral. That being said, I mentioned it earlier, avoid leaf wetness. If we don't wet the leaves, we're reducing the likelihood we'll have good conditions for a number of different diseases. In all honesty, with our high humidity, there are some diseases that's all they need. They don't even need a, a wet leaf. But the drier we keep the foliage, the better. If you do water, water earlier in the day in part because that allows the heat of the day to help dry that foliage out. That doesn't mean if you come home after work, it's the end of the day and the plants are wilted that you shouldn't go ahead and water. You may need to, but ideally you're watering earlier in the day so if they do get wet, they can dry out. We wanna promote good airflow. Again, drying that foliage, so proper spacing, don't try to crowd too much into one spot. You can actually create bad situations that way and you'll get less yield than if you had the proper space. So yes, you can to a certain extent increase the number of plants in a given square footage and get more yield up to a point that it goes wrong. And there's no magic number or way to determine that. So look at proper spacing to allow for good airflow if you are trying to go organically and really wanting to limit your uh, disease control products, you may even want to increase that over the standard space. Actually give extra room so there's more airflow in there. Training things upward is typically good for better airflow. Pruning is necessary. So like with indeterminate tomatoes, that can be important. The other thing is reducing weeds. Weeds impede airflow. Again, it's just more plants and also, any plant that's there is uh, transpiring water. And so we do have more humid conditions around plants. So we have weeds there, we're putting more humidity close to our plants as well. Sanitation, mentioned earlier, one of the big things, don't introduce diseases into your garden. So if you go to buy some tomato plants and they have some on the reduced rack and look kind of bad, do you know enough to tell is that plant's diseased or if they just didn't get watered enough? If you don't, you need to be cautious because you don't want to bring in a disease. There have been outbreaks that have been very specifically the result of commercial plants that were sold at retail that were diseased when they were brought into the air. It has happened before it will happen again. Uh, there's a financial incentive, unfortunately, for producers sometimes to ship it, whether it's good or not. Uh, and so we'll see it happen again. If we're reutilizing things, reusing, you know, a lot of us want to reduce the amount of plastic we're using. So we may reuse containers that we're growing in or start seedlings in. Nothing wrong with that. But that means we need to wash, rinse, and sanitize to make sure if we did have a disease present, we're not bringing it into that new crop. 
So make sure you do that. Follow the sanitizer directions that are on the container. Sanitizers, actually, believe it or not, are EPA regulated pesticides. They're regarded as antimicrobial pesticides. So you will actually find an EPA registration, for instance, on your Clorox bleach jug if you look closely. And there's a label associated with that. If you're borrowing tools or equipment, you may want to wash it between, before you bring it to your garden. So if you're borrowing a tiller from somebody, before you bring it into the garden, you may want to hit it with a pressure washer. Because if I was talking to a group of tobacco farmers, and I said, can you get black shape by bringing it into your farm on a piece of equipment? They say, absolutely, because it would be in the soil. Same thing with some of the diseases we're talking about in the vegetable garden. We can absolutely transport these in soil that is on equipment. So understand that. If you use tobacco, you want to be careful. You can actually get tobacco mosaic virus from a cigarette or from chewing tobacco and actually give that to your plants. So like if you were running a greenhouse operation growing tomatoes, you would have extremely strict protocols for anyone who used tobacco that worked for you. Because you can absolutely introduce this virus because the virus can be in that tobacco material and that can be the source. So make sure you're washing your hands well if you do use tobacco. Don't spit uh, chewing tobacco into the garden or, or leave your spit chewing tobacco there either because again, it can be a source of virus. The other thing we may need to do, and this is what's sometimes hard to do, is roguing or removing plants that are infested, that are infected with the disease. Because sometimes if we've got one plant that because it was weaker, it was more attractive, that's where the problem starts. We might be better off to yank that one out than try to treat it and save it. We try to treat it and save it, it doesn't go well, we can suddenly have that problem spread to everybody else. So pulling out plants that are problematic sometimes can be a huge step to making everything easy. Doesn't mean we still might not choose to use a control plant. In fact, it'd be a good idea to do it, but removing something that is obviously heavily impacted is a great step in the right direction. Understand too that weeds are reservoirs for pests. I talked about you know, getting rid of earlier growing crops um, when they're done, they're done. Don't leave them as a nursery. We certainly have weeds that are both disease and insect nurseries. And so it doesn't mean we have to have a perfectly manicured area around our gardens, but the less weeds we have present, the better off we are. One of the things sometimes people are challenged with if they are wanting to grow organically is figuring out, okay, what actually makes a product organic or not? When do I know this is truly an organic product? It goes back to these products are not certified themselves. Ordinarily, there'd be very few that would be. So you're not going to see the USDA organic certifications. That's not what you're going to look for. The other thing to understand is, for instance, a lot of people know that neem oil is uh, organic allowable or at least some is. The complicating factor is, for instance, the active ingredient in neem oil for insects is azredactin. Doesn't matter, it's the chemical naturally present uh, in the neem plant. The problem is if you take that, you have that naturally extracted, good to go, but let's say you add uh, an emulsifier or an surfactant or something like that, so it sprays easier, it sticks better on the plants, if that ingredient that's non-active isn't allowed by organic regulations, then that neem oil product is allowed. So you can't make blanket statements and say all neem oil is allowed for organic production, because in truth, by the regulations, they are. And this sometimes catches even certified growers. Mistakes happen. Uh, so something to be aware of. These are the two things that can make you your life easier if you're very specifically wanting to seek out products that are only allowed in certified organic production or would be allowed. Omri, this is a nonprofit institute who reviews products for compliance with the organic regulations. The USDA, 
uh, organic program recognizes them. If they say it's okay, it's good to go. The other thing is looking for this three leaf symbol. That three leaf symbol, whether it's for organic production or for organic gardening, and it can be different colors. There isn't a specified color it has to be. That is actually an EPA logo where they have reviewed products said that this meets the organic regulations. So if you see an OMRI approval, or if you see this on a product, you know that is acceptable for organic certified production. Now, you as a homeowner, you might not care that there's a surfactant in that name. So that doesn't mean you can't use these, just be aware this is what makes a product allowed for true organic certified production. Mentioned this earlier, just to reiterate it, prevention, especially with diseases, we have to have preventative programs in place because most of the products we have available to us, think of them like a shield or arm. They prevent the disease from infecting the plant. If the plant is already infected, it doesn't do anything. So these are barriers to infection. So that's why preventative is almost the only route we're successful with these organic control products. Be aware that the label is always the law, but we can modify it slightly. So let's say we turn off and we do have a hot, dry summer. We have a hot, dry summer. We're less likely to see diseases that like wet conditions. So we can actually decrease the frequency we spray. So the label may say spray every seven to 10 days. We're allowed to take that to 14 or 20 or whatever we want. We just can't be more frequent than seven. So we do have the ability to modify it based on, for instance, like weather patterns, but you still have to follow the label as much as what is the maximum or most frequently I can spray it. We can always reduce it, but we can't increase that. So one of the things you'll find, if you start spraying, typically you get the most benefit if you keep spraying. So even with conventional products, if you have a lapse in coverage, a lapse in that protection, you can have an infestation. Of it. And so you can become infected with that disease. And then next week spraying a barrier again doesn't do that good. So generally speaking, when we're talking about disease prevention, that means once you begin spraying, which typically you should begin spraying whenever they're in the garden, you're going to continue that through most of the season. We can vary that slightly if we have non-conducive conditions for diseases, but by and large, once you stop, it's a season long, once you start, excuse me, it's a season long commitment. One of the things that is also a conundrum for organic production, simply because a product has been reviewed to meet uh, the requirements of the organic regulations and it's allowed for use, that does not mean it is actually effective. So there are products on the market that are, you're perfectly allowed to use as a certified option, a certified operation, but it doesn't mean it actually does what you want it to. So if you actually look at the research on some products, at best, sometimes the research shows inconsistent results. And a lot of that has to do with how well are you applying these products. So these products, you know, if all you're doing is spraying over the top of plants and you're not spraying on the underside of leaves and it's not getting into the whorls of certain plants, you're not really providing good protection. So a lot of this does require that you do a good job with application. If you do a poor job with application, it's like having armor on your front but nothing on the back. And it'll just sneak around to the back. So just understand that because of that, we also generally see at least an equal and most often more frequent reapplication. Because that's one of the challenges with the products we have with the organic, they don't last as long. And oftentimes there's no residual activity with, especially with insecticides. We'll talk about that when we talked about controlling insect pests. But we typically do apply these more frequently, which means more time commitment on your part. The other thing is again, understand the modes of action. So particularly with disease product, it's about putting a barrier in place. If you don't do a good job with coverage, if you don't consistently keep that barrier there based on the label, you're going to have less success. 
We do want to make sure that we are doing things safely, even with organic pesticides. That doesn't mean that there's not concern for harm if used incorrectly. So proper rates of application. We don't want to exceed, again, what the label says, personal protective equipment. We want to wear personal protective equipment. On motor, <laughs> homeowner products, there is not a specific section for PPE. What I would say is the minimum when I'm mixing, I'm going to be wearing goggles, I'm going to be wearing gloves. So true story, when I was at UK, uh, one of the workers on the organic section of the farm was spraying a weed control product. I believe it was a clove oil product, so a natural product. He was wearing goggles, but somehow or other, some of it got behind the goggles. So he actually had to go to the emergency room because he had clove oil in his eye. As it, it, it wasn't a pleasant experience for him. No permanent damage, but certainly we've got just because, again, it's an organic product and that doesn't mean there's not hazards. So, particularly when we're spraying anything, long sleeves, pants, and closed shoes. So, don't wear Crocs out there while you're doing it. Gloves aren't bad. Um, and if we're doing anything overhead, like we're doing fruit trees or something, I'd really encourage you to look at something like a respirator and certainly goggles too. So again, just be aware, these are still chemical type products. Chemicals are just what makes everything up. And that doesn't mean that we should be exposed to some of them, even if they're organic. Take them seriously and don't be too casual. The other thing I like to do is assume even our organic products are going to be a problem for things like pollinators or other beneficial insects. So that means really we would like to spray when they are less likely to be present there in the garden. So in the evening when the honeybees have gone back to the hive is a good time to spray. Um, we want to spray when there is minimal wind, not too much, that's bad. Not too little, believe it or not, we can have problems spraying when it's too calm because we can get aversion layers that can actually carry uh, pesticide spray where we don't want it to go. So a little bit of wind is good, a little bit. We also don't want to be mixing up large quantities of stuff. So some of the organic products are actually living biological organisms. You definitely don't want to be having those sitting there for a week before you go back to use it because they're probably going to be dead. Again, your label is going to help you with that. But even still, most of the time, it's better just to mix up only what you need. So I'd much rather you mix up a little bit to begin with and have to go back, mix up more to finish, then end up with a lot left over and then you've got to do something with it. So we don't want to be dumping these just into the environment. Typically, what labels direct us to do is to apply them in a labeled area and have excess. So we don't want to be pouring them down storm drains. We don't want to be pouring them you know, just out into the environment. Even if it's an organic product, that's still not something we want to be doing. So make sure you follow storage and disposal directions. Again, for those products that are living organisms, we want to be really particular about our storage conditions. This is a really good publication from the University of Tennessee. This is one that it's not what you're going to go to necessarily to identify a disease or insect, but what it does do is do a great job of actually explaining kind of how different products work. Um, at the end, there's going to be a website and QR code that's going to provide you a PDF of clickable links for everything I mentioned and a whole lot more. So if you want to note down the name, but it's the Conventional and Organic Product Overview for Home Vegetable Gardeners in Tennessee. I got a horrible name that didn't run that through marketing, <laughs> but it does tell you what it is. It is a comparison type tool. So you can actually see where they talk about different things. One thing I like about it in the disease section, particularly, uh, and only they have a category that is effectiveness on a rating scale. So you can actually see copper, for instance, which we'll talk a lot about, it's actually poor on some. So just because copper might be effective on some things, it may not be the best option for other diseases. Uh, so, and you'll also see that there's, it's common that there is ND for no data. We don't know, the research isn't out there. So this is a good one saying, okay, is it really worth spending my money on? Do we know this is effective or is maybe it's effective? I, I like that 
particular element to this. Uh, I won't spend much time on this, but you know, there's things like uh, the serenade product, which is a live bacteria. You've got copper, which is a pretty good one. You've got neem oil. You've got potassium bicarbonate that is not baking soda. Uh, you've got another bacteria product that is actinobate lawn and garden. You'll see that pop up later. And then sulfur, which again is another fairly common product. We do have another publication that specifically has disease control. I don't think it does the best job necessarily at calling out organic options. So utilizing that first publication is a good dual approach to this, but it's a good one as well. So we kind of talked earlier kind of about the broad category. So real quickly, kind of the mineral-based disease spray products that we use. Copper, depending on the product, again, seven to 14 day spray intervals depending on when we get it applied, when it dries and how much rain. Certainly we'd want to be on the front end of that range rather than the latter. Rain does wash pesticide products off. And again, we want barriers there, so keep that in mind. The negatives associated with copper is it can build up in the soil uh, and it can in theory cause copper toxicity if you use it a lot for a while. So just be aware of that. Potassium bicarbonate has some effectiveness on some diseases such as powdery mildew. Uh, again, you know, you're looking at that weekly spray interval, which is pretty common for most of these products. Neem oil is one that is often found in stores. It's important to know there's actually kind of more than one class or type of neem oil. One of it does include the azridactin, which is the ingredient in it that affects insects. Clarified neem oil does not. So clarified neem oil is essentially just a horticultural oil. And so we use horticultural oils, they're light oils for smothering things. So we use them a lot in the landscape on stuff like scale insects that don't move. They're sucking insects that sit on a plant. So they have their purpose and they're good to use, but just understand that a clarified neem oil does not have the azeridactin, which that is actually the chemical in it that causes, I remember correctly, uh, insects not to molt correctly. It interferes with their growth and development, and that's why this is so effective. So just be aware that there is more than one type out there. Make sure you're getting the type and intent. Uh, it is included under disease control, even though that active ingredient is more thought of for insect. We have biological sprays such as Serenade. Um, the big thing on these is how are you storing them and how old is the product? So a lot of these, if you store them in ambient household conditions, they're not freezing. Uh, you know, these products can last for several years. Living ones, Probably not. This probably won't be one you're buying every season. So I wouldn't necessarily get the biggest size available to me if I didn't know I was going to use it all that season. And the theory with a lot of these biological sprays, these living products, is that basically we're colonizing that plant with a species that doesn't harm the plant so that when the bad guy shows up, there's nowhere for them. Because we know out there in the environment, we have competition among different. Uh, bacteria or fungi, um, and that's how we found penicillin. Uh, and because of that, we're putting something in place so that when something else shows up, there's no niche available to it. One thing we like to do, this is part of integrated pest management, and it's a wise approach, is alternating or varying the mode of action of products. And so what that means is all these different products act in a different way on the pest. They kill things in different ways, or they prevent growth in different ways. And by varying that, we prevent resistance. And resistance is just where a product that was once effective at controlling a pest no longer is. And so what happens if you just spray one thing over and over and over, if there is some small subset of that pest population that for whatever reason is not harmed or killed by the product you're using, it's going to successively become a larger and larger part of the population. And over time, you end up with a population that is only those resistant individuals. Now suddenly your products don't work. 
So that's why we like to vary products, vary the mode of action. And again, it's really the mode of action. We want to be careful that we don't buy another product, but if it does exactly protection in the same way, we haven't really changed them. We just change the brands. So looking at mode of action is important. That's where that comparison publication is good. Also, think about adding an insecticidal soap to your disease program, because even though you may not be targeting insects directly, it will act as a surfactant and allow things to stick better and spread better on plants. So particularly when we think of things like brassicas, they have those very waxy leaves. A lot of our sprays can not only just slide off them. So by adding something like insecticidal soap, we'll actually have a little bit better retention because again, our spray program needs that barrier protection there and having it stick better is a good thing. Yes. I've used dishwashing liquid, but maybe that's the wrong thing to use. What is insecticidal soap? <clears throat> Excellent. So I never use anything as a pesticide control product except something that's labeled for it. So like household dishwashing liquids and things like that are not labeled for the use. So technically we shouldn't use them, but here's a real story. So there's a lot of turf pests that to be able to count them, you've got to get them up out of the ground. So one of the ways you can do that, you can make basically soapy water, pour it in a given area, the larva or the caterpillars will come up and you can count them. So at University of Kentucky, they were doing this and they were utilizing just some soap they bought out of the store. It's much cheaper than insecticide soap. But they were doing this and all of a sudden they started having these big giant bear patches, dead patches where they were doing that. So they contacted the manufacturer and sure enough, the manufacturer had changed the soap didn't have to tell you that because it's a soap, it's not a pesticide product. And so when we use an insecticidal soap, we know it shouldn't be harming our plants. We may want to test it if we have something really different and unusual, but insecticidal soaps are a label pesticide product for application on plants. Soaps will strip waxes off of plants and you'll drop leaves and everything else. Be careful. These are lots of times like, uh, Potassium salts or fatty acids probably means a lot to the chemist. It don't mean a whole lot to me other than it's not the same thing as Dawn or Jewel or Palm Oil. Is that available like at the co-op? Yeah. Anywhere you would find pest control products, you should find insecticidal soaps. Again, I'm sure there are probably some that aren't labeled necessarily for use for certified organic production. That may or may not be important for you, but there absolutely are insecticidal soaps that are permitted in organic production. And they do have insecticidal activity. They'll strip the waxes off of insects, basically insects with the hydrate. So, I mean, they, they are a tool for insect control too, but we can take advantage of their uh, surfactant abilities whenever we're spraying disease control products. One thing important to understand about diseases is where they're coming from, how they come in. Obviously, we've already talked about this. They can come in on stuff we bring. So infested materials, it can't even be in a seed, depending on exactly the disease the plant we're talking about. Insect vectors. So sometimes when we talk about diseases, we're talking about controlling insects because that's where it comes from. They feed on your plant, they give your plant the disease. Weed vectors are oftentimes overwintering sites. That's how these survive through the winter. We can have soil-borne diseases, so once it's in our snow, we have a problem. We can have airborne diseases. There's some that every year they blow in. And then there's also human vectors, going back to uh, tobacco, mosaic virus, uh, and our vegetable garden with solanaceous plants. Viruses typically are in insects or in infected material. Bacteria, you know, they like wet conditions. So when we have more moisture, we have more problems. Mm -hmm. They can be in the materials we bring into the garden. They can be blown in on wind and they can come in through insects as well. Fungi, typically we either have uh, a living host or a decaying host that's the source of it. So this is one thing where it's end of the season, um, sanitation, getting those plants out of there, getting them composted. If we're doing a great job with compost, getting to a high enough temperature, or maybe just getting rid of them. If we're not doing a great job getting things to temperature, 
only way you know your compost is getting hot enough is if you're actually checking the temperature with a thermometer. Fungi are probably our biggest challenge in the area, but certainly wet years, bacteria are a huge problem. Then viruses, they come and go. So what we're going to do is a quick run through some common diseases. This is not everything, but these are some of the ones we're most likely to see. So on our cucurbit crops, so squashes, cucumbers, pumpkins, we see downy and powdery mildew. Downy here on the left, and powdery mildew looks like you put powdered sugar on it. I will say, don't let it uh, fool you that here you see this is most likely butternut because you kind of have these silvery patches along the vein. The zucchini, some zucchini varieties will do that as well. Powdery mildew looks like there's a powder on top of the leaf. Literally, the fungus is on top of the leaf. If it looks like that leaf down below where it's kind of mainly associated with the vein, the more silvery and it doesn't look like it would rub off, chances are it's just a natural coloration of the leaf. So downing and powdery mildews affect cucurbits. They're not the same disease, they're different, but we deal with them in fairly similar ways. So good airflow reduces the likelihood. Planting earlier in the season, especially with downy mildew, planting resistant varieties, which is more for powdery mildew. It's easier to find powdery mildew resistant than downy. And then also planting in succession. So know that as conditions are good for these disease, you may not get as much production out of them as we hope. So not just planting once and thinking that's gonna carry you through the whole period, having multiple plantings. So as they start getting older, you can get them out and have new ones coming on. Powdery is easier to control because literally the fungus is on the surface of the leaf. It's very vulnerable, it's exposed. Downy is much more difficult to control. It also arrives later. Typically, about the third week of July is about when it will get here a little bit later. It blows in. It's a much more destructive disease. Downy is worse. Have you ever heard of blue mold of tobacco? That is actually downy mildew of tobacco. Different species of the causal pathogen but the same class of pathogen. So just be aware of that. Uh, certainly we do have more control options for powdering when it comes to chemical control options. Um, just because it's easier for downy, probably about the only thing we have would be copper. It's probably only fairly effective. It's not great. We don't have great organic products for downy. Powdery, uh, the potassium bicarbonate wouldn't be a bad one to use for it. It's pretty easy to kill. Uh, copper would probably work pretty well. Uh, but certainly, just be aware, we see both of these very frequently in uh, our region, almost without fail. Downy sometimes is hit or miss, just depending on the weather front. So they time in and move through our area in that late July time period. But powdery, we see powdery, and it's not always the same organism, it's the same class or type of organism. We see powdery on dogwoods, on zinnias, on sweet williams. You see powdery white stuff on plants. That's powdery mildew. And again, it's not necessarily the same exact one that's going to attack your cucurbits, but you know conditions are conducive for it at that point. Early glide is one we see on tomatoes. We can also get on some other ones. It's typically identified or noticed because we start having these older leaves starting to yellow. We start looking closely, we get these concentric brown spots where there's rings to it. So it's not exactly concentric like a target, but that kind of concept where we have rings in there. It's bad because when completely ignored and uncontrolled, so this was actually from a Trial where they were looking at, okay, how effective are certain conventional uh, fungicides? This was one that was being controlled by a conventional fungicide. A little bit happening, no big deal. This one, however, had zero control whatsoever. You can see that plant is gone. The tomatoes that had formed on there are probably going to end up getting sun scald because there's no leaves to shade them. So you can completely use production quickly. Again, starts on the bottom. So some of the things we can do for this one is plant resistant varieties. But if we're planting both resistant and non-resistant, don't stick them next door to each other. Because it's like getting a flu shot and then going and sitting in the uh, you know minute clinic whenever it's flu season. It's not the best plan. You're exposing yourself to a high level of pathogen. 
much more likely to see a problem. Same idea. We want to limit leaf wetness, but also think about when we're going into the garden. So if we're going in to do things like uh, pruning on indeterminate tomatoes, for instance, we don't want to do it very early in the morning when they're wet with dew because we can actually be moving pathogens around when we do that. This is one we can do that with. Bacteria are terrible about moving that. Uh, so doing some things like mulching, because lots of times this is actually coming from our soils. So if we mulch well, we don't get soil splashing under those bottom leaves, we're less likely to see it. Doesn't mean that's going to remove all chance, but it helps. And certainly as we see leaves starting to show those symptoms, we can pull them out, trash them or burn them. So we can't actually keep it from spreading because if we just let it keep going on that plant, those spots are going to be releasing uh, fungal spores that are going to keep infecting things in our garden. So getting them out when we see it is good and our plants start to go down fast or we're removing the whole plant. Copper is a decent one on this, sulfur as well, and actinovate. Uh, is another product we we'll review. Again, the actinovates the living biological product. Ideally, we'd probably want to use two of those and alternate. So one week we'd spray one, the next week we'd spray the other. And again, that's just to give some uh, hopeful uh, proactiveness towards avoiding uh, any sort of resistance in that pathogen. Late blight. Similar name, but totally different organism. This is actually the one that caused the potato famine of the, what was it, 1840s. Uh, so it can be very disruptive. Uh, and it can not just hit potatoes, but obviously uh, our tomatoes as well. Here it is on potatoes. We're starting, you see the brown lesion on the leaf. They quickly turn black. The bad thing about this is they'll affect all parts of the plant. So not just the leaves, they'll also hit the stems, the fruit and even the tubers on the potato, which are a modified stem and not a root. So this is actually not technically a fungus, it's a water mold. So it's kind of a unique thing, but it's very fungus-like. So think of it like a fungus. It does affect not only tomatoes and potatoes, but even petunias, which are also in the Solanaceae family. Generally, this is not a problem unless we have a cold, wet ear. But when we have a cold, wet ear, it can be really bad. Again, resistant varieties, limit leaf wetness, good sanitation. On this one, copper is probably the only organic option we have. Septoria is one of our bacteria leaf diseases we can get, and there's a number of those, and they look similar. Uh, oh, wait, septoria is a fungus. Never mind. I was thinking bacterial spot because we have a lot of spots. We have bacterial spec, bacterial spot. And unless you've gone, kind of got them compared by each other, sometimes they get confused. Uh, but this is actually a fungal. This one is kind of odd because depending on conditions, it could be more or less severe. So it's not necessarily absolutely deadly to the plants, but it can drastically reduce yields under the right conditions. And one of the things it does is these plants that get the spots will drop their leaves. So any fruit you have there suddenly gets sun spots. So if you've ever seen kind of like white spots on peppers or tomatoes, that's what sunspot is. It's basically a sunburn. Um, and so this one can be a problem. Again, kind of those same basic strategies. We do have the good options on fungal uh, prevention. But again, all of these products we're talking about, they have to be used preventively. It's that barrier of protection that prevents you from having a problem. But again, these are probably our best options. I like the idea of having at least two of those in my arsenal, so I'm not just bringing one thing all the time. So what about wilts? So we can have a couple of different wilts uh, in our solanaceous crops, Fusarium and Verticillium. And actually these affect a lot of different plants. And the really bad thing about this one is once we get it in our garden, it's gonna be in our soils for a while because it has a wide range of host species if we have this as a problem, we want it to be very selective in what we plant. Because really, there are no products to spray for this that's going to prevent. We have to choose resistant varieties, and there are some that have very good resistance out there. Mulching can help because, again, it prevents soil splash because this is in our soils, but this is one that can still attack roots directly. So that, again, that may minimize some pressure, but it's not going to change anything. 
One strategy you might try if you have this is solarizing your soil. So you're in the heat of summer, kind of wetting your soil down. I probably would till then wet my soil down and then cover with uh, clear plastic with some spacers in there, basically create a little solar up, try to cook it out of the soil that way. May have some helpfulness that way. I'm not saying it's going to fix everything. Soft rocks are something we can get on a number of our different root crops or tuber crops, if we include potatoes in there. Basically, we want to be careful not to be planting these things too early when our soils are too cold and wet. So be aware of that. You do want to look at buying disease-free uh, starts each year. So whether we're talking about potato pieces or uh, carrot seeds, don't save your own potatoes year to year. You're much more likely to see this pop up if you're doing that. So buy those out of the store because they're actually checked for disease. That's why they're called certified seed potatoes because they've been examined and inspected by departments of agriculture to confirm they're not a soil. Rotations are important on this one. So even though carrots and potatoes, for instance, are totally different crop families, we don't want to be planting roots after roots after roots at the same time. So we will likely see them when we don't rotate. Add organic matter because it helps improve the soil drainage. And then don't let the crops sit in the ground forever. So once they're mature, go ahead and pull them. And I realize a lot of people, you know, some of these can overwinter in the ground, at least partway into winter, uh, such as carrots. You might cover them with a the mulch. But if you know this is a problem, I would get them out sooner and store them outside of the soil. Bacterial wilt is one that we see with cucurbits again. This is a disease, but the problem is not the disease itself, it's how it gets into our garden. Uh, these are the striped and the spotted cucumber beetle. They feed on not only cucurbit crops, all of them, but they also feed on other crops. So they'll even feed on corn, for instance. I mentioned earlier, it's a great one as a rotation crop. But this insect isn't too picky despite its name. Uh, so there are disease resistant varieties. The way we control this disease directly is by controlling uh, those beetles. Now here's the bad thing. We don't have a good control for these insects at all in the organic world. Hyganic might have some effectiveness, but very expensive. Surround is actually a sprayable kaolin clay. So have you ever heard of kaopectate? That's a kaolin clay, at least it used to uh, but literally it's a clay, and so you can spray a layer of fine clay on everything, and that's supposed to deter them somewhat. But really, we have very poor controls for these insects in Oregon. So that makes this one a challenge sometimes, because if we get high levels of those insects, we're more likely to see high levels of this disease. But again, secession planting, so as things start getting older, start getting disease, we can rip them out and have another crop already go into a place those. Row covers do work until we get to flower. So row covers, so remay or the floating row covers, whatever company that makes them. We can actually have young plants growing under there for quite a while. It creates a physical barrier. The, the beetles can't get to it but then we open them up because we're gonna have pollination and then we start seeing it happening further down the line. Cucumber mosaic virus, obviously a virus. Uh, it was originally identified in cucumbers, but actually can be in a number of different plants. It's transmitted by aphids or infected plant material. So again, we can bring it into the garden. And of course, aphids are just those little sucking insects that get on a lot of different things. Uh, certainly limiting weeds in the area so they don't have areas to increase their numbers on. So having fewer aphids is good. If we see plants that are just are exhibiting those symptoms, don't think, oh, that's pretty, let's keep it. No, get it out of it. Because if you have aphids feed on this and then they go next door to the next plant, they'll take the virus with them. Uh, and there are some disease resistant varieties for this one. Anthracnose is actually on a number of different garden vegetables. Um, there you can see it on peppers and on watermelon specifically, but it actually hits a lot of different things. 
So one of the good ways to do this is have a good mulch underneath uh, things like watermelon when they're on the ground. So they're not getting a splash from soil. It also keeps them a little bit drier on that underside. Avoiding overhead irrigation, specifically again, keeping things drier. And then if we see problems popping up with this and we can identify it, go ahead and removing those uh, fruit or plants as needed. Popper does have some activity against that practice. So that is one option. So resources, got a couple of things here. This website, if you're not familiar with it, is kind of the go-to resource for all things horticulture from the University of Tennessee. If you go to uthort.com, and then up at the top banner, click on educational resources, you'll see all those tiles. There. So they do have things categorized. I do encourage you to look at actually doing some searching because things are listed as publication things. So the most recent publication is the first one you'll see. So there may be older tomato publications, for instance, that might take you a while going through the list looking for them because it only displays like 10 publications at a time. So searching is good for this one. Uh, the other thing to be aware of, this one is mine. So it's one I put together. Uh, it's got most of the UT publications. One caveat with the UT Hort publication website is like, for instance, I know, let's see if I can find out here. Oh, I didn't update the picture, but anyway. There is one um, publication from the pathology folks at UT that does not come up on the UT Hort website. And so either they forgot to cross link it or something, but it doesn't pop up when you search for tomatoes. And it's like controlling early blight in tomatoes. So that was one that I made sure to include on this clickable links. So here is the actual uh, website tiny.utk.edu slash veg garden, or if you have your smart device with you, use your camera, follow the QR code. It's gonna take you to a PDF in Google Drive that you can download, and then you'll have clickable links. And I've got, uh, for instance, links from University of Kentucky for their scouting manuals for integrated pest management. And what's good about that is it shows you what a lot of these disease or insect problems are looking like. So understanding what you're seeing, it even talks about, you know, what are some things related to the environment? So what, what's drought stress? So there are some nutritional deficiencies that can kind of look like disease problems. And so if you don't know what you're looking for, it can be challenging sometimes to make the right determination, but that's also where you can reach out and ask me for help. So you can send me pictures, you can give me a call, I do have calls. And certainly I'm available to work with you. Uh, I know from last year's class, had a few people that have done that. So I'm more than happy to do that. That's why I'm here. So you just let me do my job. So there's my contact info. I always joke with folks that, you know, to my cell phone, you're more than welcome to send me bad pictures. You want to send me a happy picture? That's nice too. We see a lot of death and destruction. So if you, if you have a beautiful tomato and want to send it to me, that's appreciated too. It'll make, make my day a little happier. Uh, and with that, if you all have questions, we can go to those. We did have a question on Zoom. This is kind of prefacing that we will be talking about pests next session in June. Um, but she asked, can I use diatomaceous earth in my garden to control insects? So diatomaceous earth would be a possible uh, insect control product. The challenge with diatomaceous earth is you've got to put it where the insects are, and sometimes that can be a challenge, and certainly it gets washed off with rain. But yes, diatomaceous earth uh, is an insecticide that could possibly be used. Any other questions? Um, is it a happy picture? It's <laughs> not a happy picture. <laughs> so what we're seeing here is uh, insects are eating on a, is that cabbage or broccoli? They've eaten a lot of holes in the uh, leaves. It doesn't look like flea beetle because they look too big. So I'm not sure what's causing it. The holes are too big. Um, I would say looking at your newer growth, it looks less effective, which is good. 
So I would say, you know, keep good fertility on it, and probably outgrow it. And lots of times with insect damage, if you have a plant that's uh, in a good garden situation where it's got good fertility and adequate moisture, they can outgrow some problems with insects, especially young. It's like flea beetles can cause a lot of damage, but if you have a rapidly growing plant, they will outgrow flea beetles. So, and that's good because again, we don't have anything that's absolutely dynamite on flea beetles. But, you know, to me, you've got good new growth coming on. That's definitely not disease happening. That's somebody's eating on it. There's several different somebody's. Uh, and so, the other thing I would say is you can go out there, you know, flip up those leaves, look down in that world, see if you can see something. Because that's, I always tell people when it comes to, being in your garden, if you use reading glasses, they need to be with you in the garden. We're talking about looking at things that are very little. The other thing you need to do is, we, I didn't go into depth, but a big portion of integrated pest management is scouting. Do you have a problem with how much of it is there? Because depending on how much of it is there in the commercial world, it may or may not be effective to spray. You may lose money. So they actually have action thresholds. And so those can be useful for the commercial guys, but what you have to do is know what's actually out there. So that means looking on the underside of leaves. Because remember, insects, especially if somebody's trying to eat them, they're not sitting up on top of the plant normally saying hi to everybody because somebody's going to try to eat. So they're hidden. So turning over leaves, looking in plant worlds, and not just cursory passing through your garden, actually stopping and looking. Even with diseases, there are some diseases that before they're evident on the top of the disease, they will be evident on the bottom. So flipping things over and saying, wait a second, why does this leaf have something brown on the bottom and this one doesn't? That can be the start to say, okay, what's happening? And earlier you find things to damage. So if we find beetles or slugs or something, we want to get rid of them, what do you recommend for how we collect them and dispose of them? Well, if you just want to get rid of them, you know, just remove them from the garden, soapy water, throwing insects in soapy water is great. And then just warm out somewhere once they're there. Yep. Yes. Um, summer squash. I feel like the the bugs got to that pretty hardcore. And I, I looked into the leaves and I saw all the eggs and I would crush them and I would spray. And I thought, man, I'm really on top of this. And then you know, and then I came out and um, it was like they just devoured it. Yeah. So and, and the problem with you know the cucurbits is we've got like the cucumber beetles, we've got the stink bugs, we've got the squash vine borers, and then of course there's aphids and other things too. Yeah. And so the challenge is when we do use advanced products, we got to make sure we're actually getting those insects. So making sure we're getting underneath the leaf because that's where they're going to be. Like squash bugs and other things, when you come up to the plants and you're watching, you can sometimes actually see them drop off the plant and go to the ground. Uh, potato beans or another one. Colorado potato beans do that too. And so, you know, again, they're used to somebody trying to eat them. So when they start seeing moving stuff, lots of times they'll head for the hill, go disappear. So sometimes, you know, they, and that's the challenge with organic insect control products. Lots of times they have to contact that insect. There's no residual activity, which means you spray today, it lands on it tomorrow, it has no problem. Conventional products, lots of times it lands on it tomorrow or it eats it tomorrow and you kill it. And so that's the challenge with the organic is you have to have good direct contact on insects. So that means making sure you're getting on the underside of leaves, down inside of plant worlds, yeah. uh, and you know, and sometimes luck. Uh, I mean, it's not it's not always where it works out. And so you feel like planting early is planting good. early can help. Yep, uh, I do believe that. And the other thing is like using a floating row cover for insects on cucurbits can give them a head start. So at least there's a bigger plant there whenever you pull that off for a pollination. Uh, and there are some uh, cucumbers, for instance, that don't require pollination. So if you do, you have a heavy pest per, uh, pressure in a given area, you might look at utilizing some of those and keeping them on your cover. Uh, but again, that we don't have that option with every cucurbit. You feel like succession planting likely would it work there? It can like help. Once they're there, so hop to the next one. Well, and that can happen. So what succession planting does is basically when these plants have had it, 
you have some that are still coming on. Now, yes, you can get into scenarios where these plants that have had it, they say, hey, let's go to the new ones. Everybody moves over. So you still want to be doing some active control on those plants while they're there. So once you say, okay, these aren't producing well anymore, that's when you pull them out and get rid of them. And hopefully you're getting rid of those egg masks and things like that. No, you're not going to pull out every adult that's there. But hopefully you're removing at least some of the populations. Maybe I can glue it to my chain mix. Maybe that would be a possibility because I mean, what they don't eat, they'll shred. I mean, it'll, it'll break down pretty quickly. All right. Um, don't think we have any more questions online. I will say a couple things before we leave. Um, so I did forget to mention we've got our plant pickup on Thursday. So y'all should have received that email. Sign up for a time. So we'll be handing out um, plant seeds and then um, spray bottles and um, the serenade, which is the disease prevention, um, disease control that we'll be handing out as well as fish fertilizer. Um, so please be at that pickup. Um, if you absolutely cannot make it, please communicate with me prior. Um, and then um, our June workshop will actually be on pest control. And um, Adam will also be leading that workshop. So come with all your bug questions, all your bug pictures. <laughs> um, but yeah, and then also if you didn't um, put your name in the chat online, please do that so you get credit for this class. And then if you did not sign in in person, please do that um, so I can get an accurate head count. But that's it for me. Thank you guys.